Good evening. Welcome to uh, the Cavalier Auditorium at the National Academies. Um, I'm Jim Lancaster. I'm director of the Board on Physics and Astronomy here at the Academies. And it's my great pleasure to introduce David Reitze, who is our uh, speaker tonight. Uh, I'm going to give you a little background about David. David is actually a physicist. He's a, a laser scientist. Uh, after uh, obtaining his undergraduate degree at Northwestern, he attended the University of Texas, where he entered the field and it's a very demanding field of ultra-fast laser science. And for those of you who aren't in the field, uh, that's a, an area where they take lasers, they are able to stretch them and reduce them and compress them and generate light at the femtosecond level. That's the level at which uh, atoms interact and then they use them to study atoms. A very demanding field. Um, David uh, graduated in 1990. He went on to uh, industry, worked for Bell Communications. Then he went uh, to a national lab, uh, Lawrence Livermore, and then he completed the trifecta by going into academia by working at the, uh, by getting a, a tenure position at the University of Florida, um, where he still has a position. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is, even though uh, as demanding as ultra-fast lasers is, apparently that isn't demanding enough. So about 20 years ago, David decided to take his laser capabilities and start uh, uh, using them in the field of gravitational physics. He joined the LIGO team, served as the uh, team's uh, spokesman from 2007 to 2011. In 2011, he took a leave of absence from the University of Florida and became the executive director of LIGO, a position he now holds. Uh, David has a number of honors that recognizes his accomplishments. Uh, he's been elected a fellow of the American Physical Society and the uh, Optical Society of America. Uh, and then last year, year, he and other members of the LIGO team received the National Academy of Sciences Award for the Scientific Discovery of the Year. So with no further ado, ado, I join with all of you in welcoming Dr. Reitze uh, here tonight and look forward to hearing about the gravitational wave revolution. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much, Jim, for that nice introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be here tonight. It's really an honor to give a lecture in the uh, National Academy of Sciences. And what I want to talk about are, are a number of groundbreaking discoveries that I think collectively make up what I would call a revolution in astronomy in the last two years. Um, let me get started. So let's start with this. This is a slide you're going to see again later on. These waves that you see, the red and the blue waves, are gravitational waves that were detected by the LIGO observatories on September 14th, 2015, which is when the revolution really began. Um, the picture you see on the right-hand side of your screen is what produced those gravitational waves, the collision of two black holes. And the fact that we can make this measurement uh, is, is really, really a, a very stunning feat of physics and technology. So as I go through this talk, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Einstein and uh, not so much about general relativity, but about the consequences for gravitational waves. Then I'm going to talk a lot about the detector, how we make these spectacularly sensitive measurements using a technique called interferometry. And then the last probably half, maybe a little bit more of the talk, is going to be about the discoveries that we made. First, the discovery that I'm talking about now, the black holes, and then there's the, basically the observation of the collision of, of two neutron stars, which uh, was a spectacular event in many, many ways, as I, as I hope you'll see. All right, so let's get started. So this is everything you need to know about general relativity in one picture. All right, wh what's there? Well, what's there is the Earth and the Sun. And up until Einstein in, 20, in 1915 came up with his theory of, of general relativity, we had Newtonian gravity. And Newtonian gravity basically said, there's a sun, there's, a, there's an earth, there's a body, there's another body, they have mass. They're attracted through the, Newtonian, through the Newton's laws. Einstein came about and said there were problems with this, building on something called special relativity. And he, he wanted to try and understand really what was going on with gravity. And one of the things that even Newton himself recognized was that the sun and the earth 
are talking to each other through the exchange of this force called gravity. However, how does the sun know the earth is there and how does the earth know the sun is there? It must take some time for the information to get back and forth. Newton said, I don't know how to solve that problem, but I can write down equations that work really well all right, for basically launching rockets, satellites, and calculating orbits uh, uh, in our solar system. It was Einstein who then said, aha, I, under I have the missing part. And the missing part actually is geometry. And what Einstein says about gravity is basically this, that the reason the sun and the earth are experiencing a force between one another due to gravity is not because there's some magic exchange of information. It's because both of those objects have masses and both of those masses interact with the fabric of space-time that, that they sit in. So in other words, Einstein says matter and energy are one thing, that's E equals MC squared. Gra Einstein also says in general relativity that space and time are one thing and then he puts them together. And so what really is happening, according to Einstein, is that the sun is attracted to the earth because what's happening, and the earth is attracted to the sun, because when you put a massive object in the center of an empty space, it changes the natural geometry of space. It curves space-time. And the earth, you can see there's a little dimple there on that green grid, the earth also experiences that curvature, and the earth is actually moving in a straight line a geodesic, as the experts call it. But that straight line actually happens to be a motion around the sun due to the fact that space is curved at that point. Right? And that is really what general relativity is about. But now here's the catch. And here's why this is such a tremendously difficult project. All right? The way that space and time and matter and energy interact is very weak. So it takes a huge amount of matter and energy to put a little dent or a little dimple in space-time. And, the, and the, the, the coefficient, the coupling coefficient, as the experts would say, is 10 to the minus 43. Gravity is a fundamentally very, very, very weak force, much, much weaker than all the other fundamental forces of physics. And that's why it took 100 years for us to go from Einstein's general relativity to the detection of gravitational waves. Now I need to tell you about what gravitational waves are. As objects are moving, as they're accelerating, as I'm walking across here, as I'm waving my hands, I'm actually radiating gravity. If a gravitational wave were coming at you out of the board, you would see space. If I were to put a ruler down, the ruler rests in space. The space would stretch in one direction, compress in the other direction, and then this would continue to oscillate. It turns out there are two polarizations, and that's what those two uh, uh, polarizations there. What you're really measuring, the amplitude of a gravitational wave is something called a strain. Anybody who's uh, gone through engineering or basic physics should understand what a strain is. It's a change in length per unit length. When I, put a, when I take an aluminum bar, for example, and I put a force on it, all right, I can compress it a little bit. Well, that's what mass does to space. As it, mass accelerates through space, it compresses it and stretches it a little bit to produce these gravitational waves. If I leave this on too long, you're all going to get hypnotized and go to sleep. <laughs> Uh, but I will say something. There's something really fundamental about this, and it has to do with that quantity H, that strain delta L over L. Suppose I want to measure a gravitational wave. Well, if I start there and I get close to the origin, the amount of stretching and compressing is not very big. But as I move further away from the origin, it's much, much bigger. So in order to measure a gravitational wave, you have to measure a displacement, and you have to measure it over a baseline. And the name of the game, the thing that we have been trying to do in LIGO and other gravitational wave experiments over the last 40 years, is basically make big enough baselines and make small enough displacement measurements that you can actually see this effect. Now, the really funny thing about all this is that Einstein, in the paper that he actually predicted that gravitational waves exist, immediately then said, but they're of no physical consequence. And that's a direct translation from, from the paper. Uh, this quantity A is the delta L over L, and if you translate that quantity, it says that A, the gravitational wave amplitude, the strain that we're trying to measure, must have a virtually vanishing value in all imaginable cases. All right, so Einstein himself thought that this was just a mere you know, consequence that you could never actually measure. It was something that came out of the theory, but that had no consequence. And he was actually right in 1916. And to demonstrate that, I'm going to calculate, or I'm going to show you the calculation, or at least the, the answer for the calculation, of what you could try and do in a laboratory. So this is a mad scientist. Um, here he is right there. 
Uh, notice there's a guy standing back here. That guy is actually the smart person in, this, uh, in the room. All right. The mad scientist is going to basically take these two massive objects, 1,000 kilograms. They're about eh, a few meters apart from one another. And he's going to spin them around 1,000 times a second. Now, you don't really want to be in the room when this experiment is done. All right. And if you do that and you calculate the size of the gravitational wave, you get that the delta L over L is 10 to the minus 35. 0 0.34 zeros and a 1. All right. That is a dauntingly small number for any experimental scientist, any experimental physicist to try and measure. So Einstein had it right. Back in 1916, there was just no technology that you could use to do this. But then there was a recognition really about 50 years ago that there were other sources in the universe that would produce gravitational wave. And this is what is the beginning of the revolution in astronomy. So we're going to do the same experiment. We're going to let nature do it for us. We're going to take two neutron stars. What are neutron stars? They are basically the cores of exploding stars, supernova, that are left behind. We'll get more into this uh, later in the presentation. Turns out that they form in binary systems. In other words, they pair up and orbit around one another. And as they're orbiting around one another, their orbit decays because they're producing gravitational waves. Right? They, weigh, they have a mass of about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. If you do the same calculation, you come up with a number that's a little bit more reasonable. It's still very, very tiny, but a little bit more reasonable, 10 to the minus 21. So the challenge that we have is how do you make a, a detector that is capable of measuring 10 to the minus 21? And that's what I want to spend uh, the next couple of slides on. But first, since this isn't a talk about astronomy, I want to make a comparison between gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves. So let's, what, what are the same things? What are the different things between them? So we're all familiar with electromagnetic waves, light, radio waves, gamma rays, x-rays, things like that. Um, they're produced by accelerating charges. They travel at the speed of light, electromagnetic waves. They interact strongly with matter. And this is both a blessing and a curse for astronomy and for many other forms of uh, science that use light. They're very easily absorbed. So when light from a star comes and goes billions of light years or millions of light years and hits your eye, that photon that came from that star is gone. All right? uh, they come in two polarizations. And they're, in the parlance of physics, they're spin one fields. And they, they produce a quanta called photons. What about gravitational waves? Gravitational waves are produced by accelerating mass. Any accelerating mass produces a gravitational wave. But in order to be de detected, it has to be a really, really big mass moving at really, really fast speeds and accelerating at relativistic speeds. They also, according to Einstein, travel at the speed of light. So that's a similar similarity. They interact very weakly, in fact, not at all, really, with matter. And that's what makes them so hard to detect. And that's, in fact, a consequence of that thing that I showed you a few slides ago, where you have this matter and energy equals 10 to the minus 43 of, uh, or 10 to the 43 of space and time. Uh, they, they're going through you right now. As the moon goes around the Earth, you are being bathed in gravitational waves. But because the size of the effect is so tiny, you don't feel it. Uh, they also come in two polarizations, and I showed you them before. And they are what we call spin two fields. And that actually has to do with the way they're generated, the generation mechanism. Uh, it has to do with conservation of momentum and energy. We call them gravitons. That's the quanta. All right. OK. So now I want to talk about how we do this experiment. And this is, a, this is a, uh, basically an observatory that was funded by NSF, NSF's LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Obs Observatory. Um, here it is. Here's one of them. So this is the LIGO Livingston Observatory. And the first thing that you should pay attention to is size. So the, oops, let me go back. Go back. There we go. These are cars, right? And that is about, this is about two and a half miles in length, right? Uh, this one is in Louisiana. There is equally one in Hanford, Washington. So that's up there. Uh, and they're identical. And, and if you, when we go through the talk, at some point, hopefully, you'll understand uh, why we have two of these observatories. All right, so this four kilometers, this is the, del the L in that equation. So we're trying to measure something over a four kilometer baseline using this technique called interferometry. Um, 
If you do a calculation in your head, I told you we're looking for strains that are about 10 to the minus 21. That means you're looking for displacements. That's the delta L. That's the distance over, over that baseline by which space is stretched and compressed as a gravitational wave passes. That's about 10 to the minus 18, a little bit less than that. All right, so, so we're trying to measure something on the order of 10 to the minus 18 meters. All right, how small is that? Let me give you a comparison. If you were trying to make a measurement this, this, with this precision, for example, measuring the distance from the Earth to the Sun, center of the Earth to the center of the Sun, that would be like making a measurement to the precision of the diameter of an atom, which is 10 to the minus 10 meters. All right, you can think about it in another way. Suppose we were trying to measure the distance between the Sun to our nearest star, Proxima Centauri, which is about four light years away, quite far. That would be like measuring the distance to a precision of the width of a human hair. All right, so, so that's the scale at which we are, are trying to make these measurements. All right, how do we do it? Again, we use interferometry. So this is a, a little graphic that was made by a really great graphic designer at Caltech named Tim Pyle. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you basically a, 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 a video here. This is the laser. This is something called a beam splitter. It's going to split the light in two equal parts. One part of the, the beam is going to go this way, hit this mirror, come back. The other beam is going to go this way, hit this mirror, and come back. And what you're trying to do is measure the relative distances between these two, uh, the beam splitter and the, the mirror here, and the beam splitter and the mirror here. So you're trying to make a differential measurement. And um, this guy right here, this is the photo detector. This is the thing that actually is the receiver. So I'm going to play the movie, and hopefully you'll, you'll get a better understanding of it. So let's, so the laser beam sends out two light beams. Notice that there are color-coded wavelengths. The wavelength of the light is uh, about one micron. This is very pure laser light. That's the reason we can do this experiment. They come back. If the lengths of the arms are equal, no light gets to the photodiode, all of the light actually comes back here. You don't see that. But as a gravitational wave passes, right, what happens is the interference pattern changes because the length changes. And you're basically using these light waves as rulers. Right? And in this case, you're, 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 the, you're looking over one light wave. So, so our, the, la the light waves that we use, the lasers that we use, are about one micron. All right? And so these, this, in this case, the length is changing by about a half a micron. In fact, we need to make that measurement much, much better. We need to make it about a trillion times better than this. So we're looking for, again, 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the minus 18 meters. All right. All right. Well, here's a picture of it. I'm not going to go into too much into the details of, the, of it, but I want to show you sort of walking through the scale at which you have to build these devices to make them work. So. Um, Let's start with the laser, which is actually right behind there. This is the world's, we believe, the world's most stable laser, certainly one of those stable lasers. Uh, we then bring on uh, actively controlled seismic isolation. Oops, let's go back. Uh, there we go. Actively, sorry, I'm having actively controlled seismic isolation. Uh, you can think of this actually as um, active suspension. So the Earth is moving very, very with high amplitude. You don't feel it, but it's actually moving about a micron. And so what we do is we place seismometers uh, all around, and we then feed back to a platform where, where the rest of the interferometer is and suppress that noise by about a factor of 1,000. The next thing we do is we, we have these wonderful mirrors. These mirrors are the world's most precisely figured mirrors. They're about 35 uh, centimeters in diameter. And they reflect the light back and forth. So that interferometer that I showed you, the demonstration that I showed you before, is actually made up of mirrors like these. Uh, and then finally, we take those mirrors and we suspend them. We use a concept that physicists know and love called harmonic oscillation. And if you basically take something and, and turn it into a harmonic oscillator, when you excite the top of the harmonic oscillator, the transfer function to the bottom, the amount of motion that gets transferred to the bottom is uh, uh, suppressed by a great amount, basically is, falls off as 1 over the frequency squared. 
So these are the basic ingredients. There's a lot more that goes into this. There are control systems that go into it. Uh, there's tremendous amounts of data that get produced by these interferometers, about 55 mega, uh, megabytes per second. Nevertheless, this is, this is sort of the, the, uh, the ingredients that you put in place to be able to make these measurements. And this gets us to actually a level of measurement about 10 to the minus 23 meters over a certain frequency band here. All right. Um, I should point out that in addition to the two LIGO observatories, uh, there's also other gravitational wave observatories. So there's one in Pisa, Italy, called Virgo. And then there are two gravitational wave observatories under construction, one in India and one in Japan. And these observatories will be operating uh, later this decade or early next decade. And these form a network of gravitational wave detectors, and that's actually something that's going to be very important for us, too. Okay. Now... I've told you a little bit about the detectors. If you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them later on. But now I want to get to the revolution. All right. And the first revolution is the discovery of, of gravitational waves from a binary black hole merger. So this revolution really began about 1.3 billion years ago, when these two black holes, uh, what's a black hole? Again, when a star explodes, a big massive star explodes, if, if the star is big enough and the explosion is big enough, what will happen is the material that's left behind will basically gravitationally collapse and it will, the gravity will become so big relative to every other force that it will fall into a gravitational well and become what's known as a singularity, a singularity in space-time. And the black that you see there is basically an event horizon. It's something that prevents you from actually seeing that singularity in space-time. These are very massive and very compact. So one of these black holes is 36 times the mass of the sun. It's about the size of maybe Maryland. Uh, the second black hole is a little less. It's about 29 times the mass of the sun, a little bit smaller. But you get, get, you get a sense of scale here that these are very massive and very compact objects. And they, too, because of our discovery, we now know form in binary systems and can dance around one another. So let me show you what's happening. I'm going to actually, this movie that I'm playing here is not really a Hollywood movie. It's actually a, a simulation based on solving the equations of general relativity on a computer and then graphically rendering them. So you'll, the stars in the background are just there for your reference. So here's what those two waveforms actually came from. All right, these two stars are orbit, or black holes are orbiting around one another. They're moving very fast. These guys, when they actually collide with one another, are moving at about half the speed of light. And what's left over is one big final black hole. And that black hole actually has some very unique characteristics. All right. During the collision, we started with a 36 solar mass and a 29 solar mass black hole. At the end of that collision, what was left was about 62 solar masses. And if you do the mathematics in your head, you'll say some mass is, math is, mass is missing, and that's correct. There's about three solar masses that has just vanished. And the question is, where did it vanish? It went into the production of gravitational waves. In the last fraction of a second, as these two event horizons merged and collided to produce this bigger black hole, approximately three solar masses of energy was produced in gravitational waves. Now, you can from that calculate what astronomers would call a luminosity or we would call power. How much power was radiated in that event? And the answer is, is about 20 to 30 times the total radiated power in the electromagnetic universe at any given time. So this was by far the most powerful event in the entire universe when that happened. Now, that and all of that information came out of the squiggles that I showed you uh, on the graph before. Uh, there's a whole uh, really sophisticated set of, uh, of, of computer algorithms that we use to, to extract that information. All right, now I want to come back to something that I think is another element of this revolution. First of all, the black holes that we detected were undetectable any other way. At least we believe that because they don't produce any electromagnetic radiation. There's nothing else there for them to, to, to stir up charges and produce light. So it's only gravitational waves that can, that can detect them. Now, 
One of the things that is very important to know about LIGO is that the frequency band that we are able to detect gravitational waves from roughly runs from about 10 to 20 hertz to a few kilohertz. And if you remember what you learned in biology, that's, that's the, basically the same frequency range that we hear at. So this is the audio band here. And what we can do, the interferometers that we detect these things are transducers. They basically take that squeezing and stretching of space-time produced by this collision of these two black holes, and they turn it into photocurrent at the photodetector, at the output of the interferometer, which we can then store and play back. And here's what it sounds like. So that thumping that you hear is actually the ripples in space-time as they're crossing through our detector. So this is the first time, the analogy that we use, which is a bit strained, but this is, this is different from what electromagnetic astronomy does, which you, know, you see pictures, you, 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 you measure light, you measure x-rays. Here we're actually listening to space-time space stretching. So we're now in a position, and we'll come back to this more later, where we can actually get audio information about the universe. I'm going to play this again, but now I'm going to make it a little bit, uh, I'm going to shift the frequency up by about 400 hertz. And the thing I want you to pay attention to, these are the waveforms, this is frequency, this is time. I want you to pay attention to this up chirp here. As these black holes collide with one another, the waveform actually accurately maps out their dynamics. So you can clearly hear that whoop, whoop, whoop. That's called a chirp. Uh, and gravitational wave physicists love that sound. <laughs> All right. Now, what have we discovered with LIGO in the last two years? Well, there was the first event, which I just talked about, which was really the beginning of the revolution. But since we've been running, we've run uh, over two years on and off, we've actually discovered six pairs of black holes colliding with one another to produce bigger black holes. And this plot looks kind of simple in the sense that it, it's basically just a bunch of of, of black holes merging with one another on the y-axis as solar masses, but there's really a tremendous amount of information in this plot. First of all, this is the first time we'd ever observed two black holes colliding with one another. That had never been observed before. It tells us that, first of all, binary black hole systems exist, uh, and that's actually interesting in itself. Second of all, it tells us that the dynamics are such that they can collide with one another, they can radiate their energy and smash into one another in a lifetime, in a time that's less than the age of the universe. That's actually quite interesting. Probably the most interesting thing, though, is the fact that these are very heavy solar mass black holes, another uh, uh, stellar mass black holes. So all of the black holes that were detected by other means, X-ray astronomy, for example, all right, we're all sort of between the 5 and 20 solar mass range. So this is the first discovery, the one I just showed you. Immediately, this changes the way astrophysicists think about black holes, because these are much heavier stellar mass black holes. Right? Where do they come from? How do they form? So these are questions that we're starting to be able to answer as we keep operating our detectors. As we get more and more of these things, the questions we're going to be able to answer are, where did these systems form? How did they form? How many of them are there in the universe? Turns out it looks like there's, we're, we have an optimistic uh, estimate for the rates of black holes the colliding in the universe. Um, the other thing I'll point out that I think is quite interesting, which again is sort of the, you know, tilts towards this revolution theme, is the prior knowledge about stellar mass black holes comes from X-ray astronomy, which is a very, very powerful uh, tool. All right, and what you measure there, you measure by, uh, black holes accreting matter from companion stars and producing X-rays as the matter gets accelerated and falls into the event horizon of the black hole. And over the past 40 years, there have been maybe 25 of these black holes that we can identify as having known masses. And if you count up here, we have uh, 18. So within two years, we've basically almost doubled, maybe increased by 60 or 70 percent, the number of known black holes, just with this one new technique called gravitational waves. So this is quite exciting. So the first discovery, as I said, was made in September 14th. We announced it to the world in February of 2016, actually here in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club. And it got some attention. And for me, what was quite funny is that it actually got the attention of in popular culture. So I'm just going to play, uh, show you a few things uh, here. So this was a 
comic strip that came out in the Guardian uh, newspaper, the online edition on February 12th in the UK. And I'll read it for you because it's quite funny. All right, so it says, obviously we cannot see these waves. The only way we know they are real is by using another extremely sensitive device which detects scientists having feelings of excitement. Right. So, so this, this person is having excitement because they're feel, seeing or detecting a gravitational wave. This person is excited because they're eating a sandwich. All right. what, what really made me laugh, and I think a number of us who work in this field laugh, was this. Fun fact, scientists' emotional reactions are also the fraction of the width of a proton. <laughs> that is not true. All right. Uh, very soon after, maybe about three weeks after our announcement, this was sent to me. This is a website, so you can now buy gravitational wave fashion. And, and you in the front row, if you look at my tie very carefully, you, you'll notice that it's actually a gravitational wave tie. Uh, New York City, in March of 2016, again, about six weeks after this, there's ad campaigns about gravitational waves. Real estate, so quite, quite funny. All right. So, so, so this was really amazing and exciting. We were all, the people who worked in this field were very excited because it took us a long time. This, this LIGO got started really in the 1970s and 80s and became a project in the 90s. So it took 40 years for, for people working in the field. There are many of people, that, actually the, the colleagues of mine who won the Nobel Prize have been working on this for a really, really long time. Right? But then something really interesting happened and it's the second revolution that I think took place. Right? And that's the detection of a binary neutron star merger. So let me start this by telling you why this is exciting before I tell you what we actually saw. So unlike the black holes, all right, I'm coming back to something I talked about at the beginning. If you have two neutron stars that are locked in orbit around one another, they have matter. They're made up of solid. It's basically a giant atomic nucleus that weighs 1.5 times the mass of the sun. It's made up entirely of neutrons. They're also moving really, really fast when they collide with one another. And when they collide, since there's matter, there's going to, in addition to gravitational waves, there's going to be light in all, all forms. So if, if you could capture a binary neutron star at the moment of its collision, seeing it happen before as the as a, uh, gravitational waves are produced, and know that it happens quickly, you might also be able to see it in visible and infrared light, in radio waves, in neutrinos, in x-rays, and gamma rays. There are many, many ways you can do this. So this is, this is called multi-messenger astronomy, and it's the, I would say it's sort of the, the, the Hollywood analogy that I would give is this is like having talkies. So, so the, the, the electromagnetic telescopes give you the pictures, and the gravitational waves give you the sound. Right, so. We have a network of these detectors. I actually showed you pictures of them before. And the reason we have a network of these detectors is because we want to know where in the sky a gravitational wave comes from. And it turns out that that's a bit of a tricky business. Unlike electromagnetic telescopes, which have arc second or maybe arc minute uh, precision uh, localization, so if you point a telescope, you know that an event is coming from that direction or that direction, gravitational wave interferometers individually are very poor at that kind of game. They're actually more like microscopes. They see gravitational waves from almost every direction. So the way you get around that is you have multiple, you basically make a network of these things, and you time the gravitational waves as they come in. So, so these are the, the network, one, the existing network, and the ones that will be on soon. And the idea is basically uh, you have some gravitational wave emitter here, and it produces a gravitational wave. And by measuring the relative time difference you know, you can resolve the waves uh, in each detector. You know the time delay between each of the, uh, of the detectors, and that allows you to construct, triangulate, basically, and construct a position on the sky from which, these, uh, uh, which this gravitational wave came from. All right, but again, I want to emphasize that even with this, we are still, we in the gravitational wave business, are still very, very poor at this game of localizing. So instead of arc minutes or arc seconds, we deal with tens to hundreds of square degrees. And that's a challenge, actually, for the astronomers. But we're able to actually do something with this. So this is the second revolution. This is September, I'm sorry, August 17th, 2017. Uh, it starts, actually, not with us, with the gravitational wave community, but with the, the Fermi satellite operated by NASA. And they see a burst of, of uh, uh, gamma rays. As soon as we know that that happens, we look at our data, 
There's a, quite a funny story about that. And we see this. And again, you might recognize this is time, this is frequency. There's that chirp. And this to us is, a, is, a, is what we call a gold-plated event. This is such a solid event. It's immediately obvious that it's, it's some low mass, probably binary neutron star material and, uh, or collision. And then another satellite, the ESA integral satellite, actually sees gamma rays at a slightly different um, uh, frequency, a little bit higher energy. All right, and collectively together at this point, we knew very quickly that we were probably in the dawn of multi-messenger astronomy. And what happened next was quite interesting. If we were able to gather all of our data very quickly, it took us about 40 minutes from the time we knew of the Fermi uh, event and to look back at our data and make sure that it was actually valid data. And then we send out alerts, and we send out alerts to a huge number of telescopes uh, around the globe. Uh, here's actually a, just a map of some of those telescopes. I think overall 70 uh, observatories participated in this, including uh, uh, seven of the uh, uh, satellites, so the Hubble satellite, the Chandra satellite, um, uh, participated in this. And they all then went to look. And where did they look? Well, here's where they looked. All right, so these are the arrow boxes, and the one that you should pay attention to is the one that's got the arrow. Uh, uh, 11 hours after we made our discovery, uh, a, a telescope in Chile, the Swope telescope, identified that there was a new object in the sky in this galaxy. This is NGC 4993 uh, that wasn't there before. And they know that because they have references. So, so what had happened at this point is that, and they then sent out an alert to all of the telescopes in the world saying, we've seen something. And then what happened, I think, is probably one of the most massive astronomical campaigns uh, in recent memory, maybe, maybe ever. Um, approximately 70 satellites, as I said, across all bands, so from gamma ray to x-ray to UV to optical to infrared to radio, all right, basically made observations. And you, if you see that dot right there, that dot right there, that is the remnant of these two, neutro of these two neutron stars colliding. It's called a kilonova. Right, and I'll do a simulation of what that looks like uh, in, in a moment. But over a period of days and even weeks, and actually it's still being looked at today in the radio, they were able to collect spectra. And the spectra told them uh, some of the underlying physics that's going on, the astrophysics that's going on in this event. And it turns out to be very interesting astrophysics indeed, as we'll, we'll see. But I just want to emphasize how impressive this is. All right, this comes out of a paper that was co-authored by 3,500 astronomers and gravitational wave physicists. A thousand of us in the gravitational wave community, about 2,500 in the astronomical community. I can tell you that writing a paper with 3,500 authors on a major discovery of this type is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> but we did it. We were able to actually get it done. And, and, and it's really remarkable the amount of, of telescope time that was spent on this. And here is actually, um, yeah, here's the picture that emerged from, from all of these observations. All right, so here, this is actually a graphical simulation. There's no computers in this. So these are the two neutron stars that are orbiting around one another. They're actually moving at about a third of the speed of light. When they collide, they release a burst of neutrons, and they produce a gamma ray burst, and that was the gamma ray burst that was seen before. All right, they also produce, uh, as time goes on, they produce ultraviolet light, blue light, uh, red light, infrared light, and eventually radio waves as, as the, the matter from the, the collision of the neutron stars actually expands out and hits the interstellar medium. And this process produces uh, a lot of interesting nuclear reactions, something called R processes. So you've got a very, very, very dense, two very dense atomic nuclei that are supermassive. So this is the world's best particle collider. And as these neutrons are free, they undergo beta decay, and what happens is there's a rich, dense neutron environment, so a lot of nuclear reactions take place. And those nuclear reactions actually lead to some, some, some elements that we, we know and love. All right, so this is the periodic table, which you've seen before. And the color coding shows you where we believe all of these elements come from. So hydrogen and helium mostly come from the Big Bang. The lighter elements in blue here come from either uh, massive stars, supernova, or dwarf stars, which are smaller stars that, uh, like our sun, will eventually end up to. Everything that's in, in yellow here, 
all right, uh, comes about from merging neutron stars. So, all right, or mostly produced by merging neutron stars. So if you're wearing gold, if you're wearing silver, if you have platinum on, chances are that the gold, the silver, the platinum that's in your rings or your bracelets or whatever was produced by the collision of the neutron stars much like this one many, many billions of years ago. The abundances of elements, these heavy elements, the lanthanides, has to be driven by that process. And that, all of the data from, from, our, uh, uh, from our observations uh, is consistent with that. So that's actually quite, uh, quite nice. And if anybody has any uranium, I don't, you do. Uh, uh, it, was also produced, it was also produced here. Now this is really interesting, right? Because if you think about it, all right, first of all, how does a neutron star form? It forms because a star explodes. It's the end of the life of a star. All right, so that's one, and then that star basically populates you know, that, that explosion produces elements, oops, let me come back, produces elements up here. Then that star happens to be in a system paired with another neutron star that also, well, a supernova that explodes, produces a neutron star, and then they collide again. So this, th these elements are really founded in, in, in a really, really, twice they have to go through a, a process of exploding and colliding to be able to get there. So, all right, so this is just sort of the, the beginning of this whole story. This is, like I said, the, the first and second wave of the revolution. What I want to leave you with is the final parting thought here. And that's this. It, everything that I've told you happens in this frequency band. So you can think of gravitational waves, much like electromagnetic waves, as having a spectrum. We, in the gravitational wave ground-based community, look at what we consider to be the sort of the highest interesting uh, uh, frequencies or shortest wavelengths for compact astrophysical events taking place. However, there's a whole range of longer wavelengths and uh, uh, lower frequencies that also are, are interesting. And let me just walk through some of them for you. All right, so below us, all right, so if we go from maybe this is one hertz, this is a kilohertz, in this range from about 100 microhertz to uh, uh, one hertz, there are lots of interesting sources there, including massive black holes, intermediate mass black holes that have smaller black holes running around them. Uh, and you can detect them using a space-based analog of what we do. That's called the laser interferometer space antenna. And this is something that is going to be launched, uh, we hope, probably in the 2030s. All right. And you're looking at a completely different kind of event with this. So it's quite complementary to what we do. And in fact, the black holes that we detect will be seen by, oops, sorry, will be seen by Lisa uh, years before we see them. So Lisa will be able to tell us when we're going to be able to see black holes. Um, going one step further, in every galaxy, we believe, or most every galaxy, there's a, a big massive black hole, supermassive black hole, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9 solar masses. When those galaxies collide, those supermassive black holes can get bound to one another, and they also will orbit around one another and produce gravitational waves. They can also be detected by a completely different technique using radio, basically pulsar timing. By measuring the difference in timing of pulsars that are in our galaxy, that difference carries information about these massive galaxies that are colliding in this uh, supermassive black holes. Then finally, perhaps the most interesting, is the Big Bang itself. All right, all we know about the universe comes from, again, mostly electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation uh, didn't exist in the universe until about 380,000 years after uh, the Big Bang, and that just has to do with the, the dynamics of the universe when neutral, neutral hydrogen formed and light was, able to, light was able to escape. However, gravitational waves were produced right almost at the moment of the Big Bang, and they are detectable using different methods, using basically very, very sensitive bolometers. They have to be in, in a very special place in the South Pole. If you could detect the gravitational waves from the Big Bang, you'd be able to look at the universe right at the moment of its birth, and that would give us tremendous amounts of information about, about how the universe formed in cosmology. So, so we are right now just at the very beginning of, of this wonderful uh, revolution. And I should point out that uh, as we go forward, not, you know, all of these things will be taking place, but we will be making improvements to our detectors to the point where we believe within a few years we'll be seeing black holes colliding every few days, maybe even every day. We'll be seeing binary neutron stars colliding every month. We'll be able maybe to detect supernovas. There are many other sources that we can detect. So there's, there's really a wide panoply of, of, 
of, of interesting astrophysics out there. So I think with that, I'm going to stop and just, again, give my main message that I think this revolution has begun and it's quite interesting. Uh, I want to thank the National Science Foundation who has really, really uh, uh, been committed to this project over 40 years. This was a very high-risk project. When you first hear about it, when I first heard about it, I thought it can't really work, and then I studied a little more and I did. The fact that the, the NSF supported us, I think, is a testament to, to, to their commitment to fundamental science. Uh, I have colleagues at Caltech and MIT, and then there's a much broader collaboration called the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. It's about 1,200 people that really are very much responsible for most of what I've talked about here tonight. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Please, go ahead. Um, it's going to be a fuzzy question, but I was reading something to the effect that the probability of that initial collision from the first detection was actually quite improbable. Is that correct? Did you, what, what's the analysis show about the likelihood of two black holes of that kind of a mass existing and somehow managing to yeah. find each other? Yeah, so there are two, two ways to answer that. Uh, first, first way is, um, in our game, it's all about rates. It's a question of how many of these binaries black hole systems exist, how often are they produced. Uh, and the uncertainty before we made our observations in those rates was actually quite large. It was three orders of magnitude. So from that sense, you know, uh, maybe it was a little bit lucky, but not much. I think the more interesting question you're asking is the fact that they were heavier mass black holes. That actually is something that I think was very, very surprising. There are models, in fact, there are, I believe maybe even people in the audience who know more about this than I, that, that you can predict if you have two stars that are locked in orbit, you know, each of them explodes. As long as the energy that's released in that explosion doesn't kick the other star out of orbit and then it explodes, you can form an isolated binary system. But in order for those systems to be very heavy, there are very special conditions on the, on the stars. For example, they have to be very old stars. They have to be mostly hydrogen-like stars. So that part of it is the part that I think is surprising. And, and, and as we get more of these, we're going to start to do what we call population uh, 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 studies, all right? You, get a, you could basically get a population of masses. We also are interested in the spins of the black holes. That's a little bit harder. And we'll start to be able to answer these questions a little bit more. But I think the mass part of it actually was quite surprising. So why don't we go over here? Yeah. It's so similar to sonar, is there a way for you to derive information about things that the gravitational waves have passed through on their way to the detector? So to give you more insight into sort of the internal function of the black hole or other? Yeah, so things? not so much the internal function. I mean, what we do in some sense do is sonar, right? You could, you could easily put Bose headsets on and, and listen to that chirp that I played. And, and after you get really good at it, you could say that's a 10 solar mass on 20 solar mass. Black, black hole. The waveform has a lot of information in it, and that's actually how we get the masses out of the black hole. I can explain it later if you're, if you're interested. Um, I, the, 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 all of these gravitational waves are naturally, when they come, they, they, they basically stretch and squeeze the detector. So you get that, you sort of get that information for free as they pass, as they pass through the detector. The challenge for us is to see more of these. And so what we're trying to do is make better and more sensitive detectors. So that delta L over L, we have ideas for, for making that even 10 times more sensitive. All right, and that, that way we'll be able to see these things much, much more frequently. I think I answered your question. I hope I did. If I didn't, rephrase more, it. More about the, as, so you talk about the, the large mass of objects as they create the gravitational waves and you detect the waves themselves. But how much do you learn about the things that the wave has passed through? Oh. Yeah, so, so uh, we rely on our knowledge of general relativity, all right, and two things about that. First of all, these wave sources, basically, when they're produced, the, the, we measure the amplitude of the wave, which falls off as one over the distance. All right, so all, all, once we extract the masses from the, the waveforms, we then can say something about how far away they are, so we know that. The other thing to say about it is that, that gravitational waves interact extremely weakly with with, with the Earth. So there's, there's in some sense no effect other than the fact that we record this waveform that we can gain information from. I guess that would be the best way to say it. Okay. Yeah. As you bring more observatories online, uh, in addition to perhaps improving your tri triangulation a bit, yeah. uh, 
Are there other things you'll learn by having more? Um... Yeah, so one thing I didn't talk about, I talked about it briefly, was polarization. All right, so, so the polar gravitational waves are common to polarizations, and the source, learning something about the, the polarization emitted from the source will tell you something about the astrophysics of the source. For example, um, if you... If you think about a binary neutron or binary system that's orbiting, right, the light that, or the gravitational waves that come perpendicular to the plane of orbits is circularly polarized, whereas the light that comes this way is linearly polarized. So if you can resolve the polarizations, you can say, for example, something about the angles of the, of the inclination and things like that. So there's a little bit of information there. The, the thing, the really, the, the, the thing that the, the network gets you is that these detectors are not always online. And so, like right now, there, there's no interferometer that's actually working. We're all offline trying to make, our, make improvements to our detectors. Um, when they are all online, some of them, they drop out. There's always something that perturbs the interferometer. Earthquake, for example. Sometimes a truck drives by and causes a problem. I mean, they're that sensitive. And so by having more of these on, you just have redundancy in the system so that you can, that you can uh, be able to still detect the, gra the gravitational wave. So those two things, polarization and redundancy, are what we're, what we're after. Yes? Uh, so what's the outlook in being able to measure the uh, gravitational waves from merging white dwarves? Uh, you know, I'm not sure how much more sensitive it would have to be and what the time frame would be before that would be possible. Yeah, so that's what Lisa does. Um, Right, so, so the, the white dwarfs actually, be, because they're not as stiff as neutron stars or as black holes, basically they sh as they get close to one another, they rip apart. So the, the waveforms actually, the, the, the frequencies of the waveforms basically only go up to subhertz and things like that. So, so Lisa will be able to see, see some of those things. Very much. I was just wondering, if you mentioned that Einstein sort of predicted the concept of these waves, if not the amount of technology that would come along to be able to measure them, um, from your perspective, what would you say is the biggest surprise that uh, you or the community have experienced in trying being able to measure them? Um, yeah. Uh, so the biggest surprise, well, there are many, but let me just start at the top. The, the fact that you could actually see the squiggles in the data, none of us predicted that. Everybody thought that we would have to use computers, thousands of core hours of computers, to tease out the waveform. We, we use a technique called match filtering, where we do cross-correlations. The fact that this, this, wave, this thing was so big that you could see it in the data, it was very simple filtering, was just shocking to us. That, that was number one. Uh, the other surprise, I think, was the fact that the first neutron star, the binary neutron star that I talked about, we were able to get it with the two LIGO and the one Virgo detector, and there's an interesting story there, too, and, and get the E&M community, the, all the astronomers, to point their satellites, and the first event, we actually see both light and, and gravitational waves. That was something that I would have never predicted myself. So, so those are things. What, what else is surprising? There are lots of binary black holes in the universe. That's quite surprising. They're very, they're very massive. That's quite surprising. Um, we now think we know where heavy elements come from. That's quite surprising. So that's, that's all, there's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions from, I'm told that there might be some questions coming in online. Or right, we have a few questions from online. Bill asks, are there any indications of what a black hole collision would look like? Well, so the simulation that I showed is what it would really look like if you were, if you were in a spaceship about, oh, I don't know, 1,000 kilometers, maybe 5,000 kilometers from those two black holes, and you, know, you were looking at the orbital dynamics, that is, in fact, what you would see, those, the, the merging of those uh, two event horizons. What happens inside that, we have no idea. That's just something that, that, that physics doesn't tell us how to get to at this point. So. And uh, Lori asks, is there any loss of mass in this merger when the black holes collide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in the case of, in most cases, there's about one to two or three solar masses that are produced uh, in, in those collisions. So basically, it's like take three times the mass of the sun and just poof, it goes away and it goes into gravitational waves. So a lot of, this, is, this is E equals mc squared in its most pure form. And 
Are there any concepts on how cosmic streams, strings are a part of this? So uh, we search for cosmic strings. We have a, you know, so there are models for, for cosmic strings, how when they cross one another, um, they basically will produce a cusp, and that cusp will produce gravitational waves. So we look for that. We haven't seen it, so we can't really say anything uh, other than the fact that we're looking, and if we see some a burst of gravitational waves, it, we might be able to say that it comes from cosmic strings. So stay tuned. That's one what I would say stay tuned for. Okay. Anything else? All right. I think we're done. Thank you very much for your attention.